Okay. We are back for Growing Down podcast episode six now, and we are joined today by Andres Bernal. Welcome, Andres. Thank you for having me. My pleasure to be here. Of course. Um, it's, it's great to have you. We, are, we connected first through Discord, the Integral Discord channel, and you kind of just uh, appeared there in one of our conversations, one of our Zoom calls with a very interesting background, right? Like, so, um, and I believe it was one of our live stream, like political discussions off the cuff. And uh, we really appreciated what you had to say. And we're very curious about learning more about your background. So it's great to have you on the show to go over that a little bit. So uh, maybe to start off, uh, we can begin with talking a little bit about what your background was. We know you had a connection with AOC, you did some work with her, um, you've been involved in progressive politics, you're a professor. So you have a very interesting um, uh, very interesting credentials to be on Growing Down podcast, and we appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of an interesting story um, to how everything led to me even being on that Discord <laughs> um, and, and like the different paths that, that led me in that direction. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country when I was three years old. I, I was born in, in South America and Colombia. And so I guess, you know, that part of my story is a very formative experience because it, you know my, my perspective on things always comes from that sense that I'm from another place and things happen and they're different in another place and then thinking about the world internationally and, and, and um, how we construct our identities differently, um, how we learn to code switch, like all of those things were very a very big part of my life. But by the time um, I got to college, I decided to study philosophy. That's, that was like the thing I was most interested in. Um, because I was raised by, um, you know, my parents were uh, people who were, are, are very well read and they were uh, very interested in making sure that I received a kind of a in-depth education from very early on uh, about politics and science and history and literature and all these kinds of things. And so um, for me, the next step when I was becoming an adult was to study philosophy. And I kind of had two streams that were of most interest to me. One of them was like, you know, kind of just straightforward politics um, and understanding systems and, and social systems and power and that kind of stuff. But then the other one was more of this personal developmental part of myself and my own identity, probably very influenced because uh, I'm an immigrant and, and how that unfolded. And so I was very into like existentialism um, I was a very secular person, and so finding and constructing meaning for myself, um, developing a kind of spiritual side to myself um, was something new to me uh, as well. And so existentialism, theories of consciousness, trying to understand, you know, the big questions like the meaning of life, uh, questions about qualia, I was really into the matrix when I first saw it, like that, all that stuff, right? So from, from then on, I think like these two, trying to make sense of both of these interests, um, set, let, laid the groundwork for how things went on from there. Um, when I started graduate school, I went to a program that offered a master's in leadership. And so, you know, that sounds very abstract, kind of general, vague, like what the hell is that even about? Uh, but what, what caught my attention about it was that it tried to integrate these two parts of my of my interests. On one hand, there were classes on social issues, um, courses on policy, and in particular, they had one course where you could tra travel to Spain and study alongside people in the Mondragon Cooperative, which is, you know, this very famous worker-owned business, 12 billion in profits, thousands of, thousands of employees. Everybody owns it collectively. They vote on a management team, all that really fascinating stuff. So they offered that. And they also offer like human development, uh, coaching, consulting. Um, they introduced this, uh, this approach to leadership called group relations work that uh, uh, in Europe, it's uh, kind of known under the Tavistock Institute. And here in the United States, it's known under the AK Rice Institute. Um, and so that's all about applying um, psychodynamic ideas and, and psychoanalytic theories onto how groups behave and the different kind of needs that people have in groups, the way that authority 
and boundaries and roles are projected onto one another. And so there was a lot of experiential based learning. In fact, our first semester, the whole semester was just structured like this class, like nobody would teach anything. We would just sit there and allow things to happen and try to understand what was happening in that room in that moment and what were the dynamics that were unfolding. So that was really, really interesting uh, to me. Um, and my, my interest in leadership came because I, as a high school student, participated in this um, organization that was creating summer programs for young Latinos across the country. And um, it was also very experiential. It was very much based on trying to construct new meanings in life. Um, we, we, we would like form our own government and run for office and stuff. We were all like 16, 17 year olds, give speeches, learn to be in committees, learn to pass legislation, but very much grounded in the sense of like, all right, who are, who are you as an individual and who is this community as US Latinos and international Latinos? Um, so that was, that kind of like, planted that seed that um, any kind of social dynamics were heavily influenced by the construction of meaning and the kind of place in our development that people were in. Uh, it, it was, that was very plant, planted in me very early on because I, I, I had such a formative, transformative experience through that program. Um, you know, I gave this speech and I was elected as a Supreme Court justice and uh, I was kind of being um, taught how to uh, question many of the values that you know, your typical high school student had. Um, so that was very formative. And from participating in that institute, I heard of this other kind of rock star person from the Bronx who was recruited to be part of this too. And she wrote like the introduction and edited the founder's book that he had released. And it was like this rising star or whatnot. So we had like this big event in Austin, Texas, and she gave a speech and it was just like quite obvious. She's an incredibly charismatic person. So this was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And um, the both of us, both of us were kind of teamed up as alumni and influential kind of next generation leaders that came out of this institute. So that's where that came from as well. So um, basically I, I finished my master's and I hung out in Austin for a year, worked in a couple places, but decided to pursue a PhD. So I moved to New York uh, and I start my PhD at the new school in policy. And um, that's where I became even closer friends with, with Alexandria. Um, and then I think the Trump election really impacted us um, and she just told, she, she went on a trip to Standing Rock um, and put it on Facebook. And when she came back, she said, I'm going to run for office. So that's how that story unfolded. Um, so my, my interests have always kind of had these two narratives, you know, e economics, politics, social theory, and uh, leadership, deve social development, human development, stages of development, that whole piece as well. That's awesome. Um, we could talk for hours, you know, about all of that. <clears throat> but could you just describe what your role was with AOC or what role you played in her campaign? Yeah, I mean, you know, at, at first it was just like, awesome. I mean, this seems like a long shot. Uh, you're challenging the third most powerful, powerful Democrat in the House. Nobody knows you uh, in, in politics. But let's do it. Let's go for it. Let's try something crazy. I mean, we were brought up and trained to you, you know, just go for it and challenge oneself to build the necessary support around you um, to kind of mobilize communities. So we had that experience. Um, so, you know, as it started off, I, I kind of tried to connect her with people that were throwing events for Bernie Sanders and that sort of kind of movement in, in, uh, in throughout New York. Um, and then I started to speak to her more about more specific policy things. So my own research was having kind of a transformational experience at the time too. I went from studying or from focusing on worker cooperative businesses, democratic ownership of firms, credit unions, um, consumer co-ops, social entrepreneurship, all these kinds of 
kind of new growing um, structural designs, I should say, in economics to finding myself frustrated because I felt like a lot of these agendas and efforts were, were great, but they were missing a plan at the macro level. They had no plan for how policy could, could support and foster these, these innovations. So um, I was uh, reading a guy named Carl Polanyi, who is a kind of famous economic sociologist, very much writing a lot about um, how we make this mistake of thinking that the economy is this separate, independent realm of experience with, with its own laws that's completely independent and separated from people and, and like the, the complex nuance relationships that we have with one another. It's like, yeah, we, we, we do things with one another, but then there's the economy, right? Um, and so that was already on my mind. Um, you know, he has these things called like theories of embeddedness and understanding economies as embedded in all other kinds of social relations. And uh, it was also the, the primary election. And, and like most elections, whenever progressives propose big structural changes, like guaranteeing certain universal rights in healthcare and education, things like that, you kind of get this response of, you know, well, how are you going to pay for it? There's no money for that. Um, and if and if you are going to raise the money for that, you've got, you got to raise it in taxes from like everybody. And even then, then you'll fall short still. And, um, you know, it's this, this legacy of 40, 50 years where a certain bipartisan consensus has been made around the way the economy works. And I was always really skeptical of this, uh, particularly because it didn't seem to totally make sense with how we got out of the Great Depression and how we mobilized for the Second World War. Um, you know, the economy had collapsed during the depression, so there wasn't much money to raise anyway. So it didn't really make sense to me. Um, and I had uh, attended a conference in 2014 called Rethinking Economics. Uh, it was an amazing conference. And there was this group of people that called themselves the Modern Money Network. And they would go on and on about modern monetary theory. And it sounded kind of cool. They had a cool logo, but I never really like, gave it a lot of attention. I, I always told myself, I'll go back to this one of these days. <laughs> so, you know, four years went by. And when Trump was elected, I was like, all right, you know what, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna look into this stuff, because maybe I was looking for something different. And I start reading about it, I start YouTubing videos, and I'm like, holy shit, this, this is this is it like, this is huge. This is the paradigm shift that I've been looking for. Uh, in terms of the the intersection of policy, money, and economics. <clears throat> uh, so this movement was also growing because the kind of top figure or one of the spokespeople uh, is an economist named Stephanie Kelton. She had been hired to be Bernie's chief economic advisor at that time. And so there was a big kind of growth of visibility for MMT. Um, so I start getting connected with those people and they, they brought me in very quickly because, you know, we, we kind of connected and, and things like that. I got to know Stephanie, I got to know others. And I told them like, look, there's this candidate in the Bronx. Uh, she's really talented. You know, she, it, it's a long shot campaign. I don't know if she's going to win. Uh, it, it, it's going to be an uphill battle, but she's great. And you all should, you all should look into her. So they kind of all agree, like there's something special about this person. Um, so I connected her with Stephanie Kelton, with some others, and I start talking about job guarantee, which is one of the big ideas that MMT proposes. I start talking to her about, you know, we, we should rethink the way we discuss this, how are you gonna pay for a question? Most of what we all assume is, is correct is actually wrong. Um, we start having these dialogues. So I, in that sense, I play more of like a policy advising role, um, which becomes critical in the discussion, in the debate about what the Green New Deal is going to look like after she wins. So uh, she wins and it, you know, changes American politics. It's this huge event that happens. Um, and, and, you know, we had established certain kinds of connections. Um, there are a lot of people uh, around her and the campaign and the office now, and there's a lot of influences, but we've been blessed with the opportunity to be one of those voices. 
um, that's building a relationship with her uh, and, and that, that has had a role in shaping what the Green New Deal is, shaping the policy agenda, and now we kind of are expanding into other um, congressional representatives as well and, and many other people in, in politics. So that's that, that story. Awesome. Uh, so uh, I, I like this idea, and this is something that I, I've been wondering about too, uh, especially as uh, right now I'm, I'm working to set up Liminal and we're kind of bringing a different crossroads of activists and people who are working in permaculture design and regenerative culture. And they're bringing together some of the, the ideas that you're talking about, worker cooperatives, um, land banks, in terms of like, well, how do we build resiliency at the local level, not only bioregionally in terms of our ecology, but also in terms of economic resilience at the local level. But there's not so much discussion about policy that you're describing. Like, how do we scale this so that institutionally these practices are um, a favored more right and there's more literacy around that there's more availability and perhaps ease of turning your company into a cooperative or starting one right just like in terms of education and legislation but then also be um, how to say this um, allowing the institutions to begin to look more like what we're seeing on the ground with these decentralized uh, common centric uh, orientations and practices, right? So I've always been wondering about how we scale that because so much of the kind of the, the visionary culture or even in the integral community, there's this sort of kind of anticipation of a more integral civilization or more integral country. But that's always the question, how do we scale it and how do we use policy as sort of a leverage towards that, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's sort of my question in terms of like, how do we scale this thing to deal with the civilizational crisis that we're in? Yeah, I mean, that's, that was like the question that I kept running into myself. And there are, I think, there are certain trends that seem to want to scale up without engaging the state. Um, and I think that's a mistake because it gives so much leverage to, there's this common assumption that I think we've installed in our minds that our options are either big government or small government. And I think this is, it, this, is, uh, this is a mistake. This is not the best way to understand the way that the state actually operates because we can assume like, oh yeah, we'll have a small government, but in reality, it's actually a huge government and it's doing things that we don't want it to do. So if we give up on the state, the state ends up doing things or be used for things that will benefit, support, finance and foster monopolies, you know, the, the mass incarceration, uh, industrial complex, all of these things, right? Um, so how I became very interested with how do we engage, you know, the different levels of this thing we call the state and how do we use it uh, to change it, to transform it, uh, to keep it accountable, to make it more democratic, uh, but also to foster this other world that we want. And there are, there are, you know, for me, there are like three big things that, that government can, can do, uh, especially at this kind of federal national level. I mean, on one hand, the conversation is very influenced by what many of these people talk about and what they refuse to talk about. You know, where the parameters of discussion are play a huge role. So people like Bernie, people like AOC have expanded that. Uh, and then you have law. Um, we really take for granted all of the legal mechanisms and infrastructure that are required for this monopoly based system to flourish and what don't you use help foster a more cooperative common space democratic economy so much of that is in law um, and uh, there are a lot for example there are a lot of different ways that collectives could form that would probably be, probably be punished by monopoly laws um, in a very unjust way um, so we really do a disservice to just experimentation in ownership models by not providing that kind of support. So law is definitely second. And then the third, the big one is money, is, is, uh, is money, which that's where kind of MMT came in for me to understand the, the, the theory of money that MMT has and how understanding this is kind of a game changer in politics. 
Yeah, <clears throat> awesome. Um, before we segue into a deep dive into MMT, something, Andres, that I've talked about on this show before, are you familiar with Herbert Crowley? He coined yeah. the term, you know, Hamiltonian means to Jeffersonian ends. Oh, right, right, yeah. And, and that's something, it reminds me what you're talking about of that phrase. And part of my frustration along with, you know, what Jeremy was saying, Brent Cooper's frustration with a lot of these consciousness emergencia sense-making communities is they seem to be Jeffersonian means to Jeffersonian ends. And they didn't quite encapsulate the importance and role of government, including setting up the playing fields to actually allow these decentralized grassroots initiatives and communities to flourish. And so I've been so happy to, to have this conversation and to really explicitly outline the importance of the state and, and the consciousness and literacy around the impact and role and even the potential that the state can have to allowing this future that we all want to be birthed. Absolutely. Yes. Um, one of my dear friends, Robert Hockett, uh, who's kind of a person who's advised Bernie and Warren and many people, uh, he speaks a lot about this kind of integral um, pursuit of uh, Jeffersonian and Hamiltonian means. And uh, yeah, he's, he's mentioned that quite often too. Yeah, I mean, people take for granted, especially in many um, communities that are invested in consciousness building and things like that, they, they tend to be people who already uh, have been provided the cultural, institutional, and legal support throughout their life. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's, there's controversy and conflict between to what degree ideas are being co-opted from the struggles of Black and Indigenous communities throughout history without kind of giving credit to, to those communities in that history as well. Um, so, so, you know, these are the kind of the things we, we take for granted that if you have an entire historical legacy of col you know, colonization and the way that uh, capitalist economies have developed to kind of set up the playing field and the rules, you know, yeah, it's much more easy to talk about consciousness building. Um, but to go beyond that and understand the, how do we scale this up to truly transcend just small pockets of privileged people, but rather to socialize and collectivize it to all of us, will require much more in-depth political and policy debates and conversations. So yeah, I totally resonate with that. They need to check their privilege. Perhaps a bit. <laughs> I, I couldn't I resist. Know, uh, what, um, what Michael Bowens was actually writing in his um, Commons report, the peer-to-peer -peer report that he published on on liminal and one of his main points to echo what we're saying here, right, is that during the corona epidemic, the markets have no role really in finding a solution to the crisis, right? The, 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 the nation state as an institution has played an indispensable role, as problematic as it is, right, as, as broken as it is, as perhaps outdated as it is, um, it, it is not replaceable at this point, right? Um, the kind of translocal or transnational uh, common centric institution that we were hoping to achieve one day. Um, in the meanwhile, we still have the state, right? Um, and in the meanwhile, we still have to interact with it and think about policy and think about what role the current institutions have in sort of safeguarding the emergence of these new post nation state common centric uh, forms of, of of governance that so many of these interesting kind of innovative um, uh, utopian visions have, right? Like I've just been looking at some of them, like not only the Peer to Peer Foundation and what Michael Bowens is doing, but like, um, what is it called? Uh, have you heard of the Disco Manifesto? Mm -hmm. uh, so the decentralized, uh, it's basically kind of like a counter to decentralized autonomous organizations, focusing way more on kind of human centric economic policies and ethics. So there's so much there, but at the same time, we have to kind of hold both. You know, it's kind of a complex um, approach to, the, to this question where we can't just sort of go, no, this is the future, let's not engage with politics, right? Versus let's just only engage with what is available to us. Like we as integral folks, I think, have again, like I brought this up many times, this mediational role right now in terms of like anticipating what might be emerging but being deeply, deeply literate about what actually we have on the ground and what we can actually affect in terms of policy. Um, but anyway, I, I would love for us to go into, into uh, MMT if, if you're ready for that, Andres. Yeah, sure. So, you know, money is this 
you know, kind of interesting thing where people, I, I've, I've found it fascinating the degree to which people have a very personal relationship to their theory of money, <laughs> that if you question or challenge, people get very upset as if it was, you know, something far, far more personal to their own identity. Um, we have that relationship to what we think money is. Uh, for me, it's been something I, I've been curious about from a really, really young age. I remember, I think maybe I was like 12 or 13, and I started asking people, like, what is money? And what's up with this whole gold thing? You know, why gold? Why was that such a, a, a big role in the history of money? Um, and, and I never had those questions answered uh, until I started to study MMT. So, you know, MMT is, I mean, I think it's really important to first know, like, what, what is MMT? Because people all the time ask me, uh, can you do MMT in this scenario? Or, or, or does MMT work under these conditions? Um, so so to kind of to be clear, you know, MMT is, is not trying to be a thing that you do, but rather it's a series of uh, understanding and insights that have been brought together to construct this analytical framework that has like two functions. On, on one end, it is, it is describing money and the role of money in monetary economies, the way kind of the plumbing of these systems operate. Um, and from that kind of point of departure, it's, it's trying to say, okay, if we understand that this is how, this is what money is, and this is how money works in today's world, what can we then do? What are our limits? What can we do? And what should we do if we agree that we want something like a full employment economy or a Green New Deal or stability and not kind of be uh, so, so caught up in these like 10 year crises that always tend to happen? Um, so that's kind of like what it is, right? A lot of people confuse that or don't understand that kind of foundational points and analytic framework for understanding uh, this is the way things are actually operating. And that is based on a theory of money, which is different from the mainstream. So in economics, um, for the last 50 years or so, um, this, this approach or this tradition to economic thought called neoclassical economics has dominated. And this is kind of the typical, you know, thing you're taught in Economics 101, which, you know, as a foundation, it is that the economy is constructed by individuals that are trying to satisfy their preferences and their self-interest. And so when these individuals are all trying to satisfy their interests, they will reach certain kinds of agreements or, you know, trade um, so that they have like equilibrium points where my interests and your interests meet a match. No one's worse off anymore. And at that point, things balance out. You know, so, so that's kind of the foundation to where self-regulating markets come from in, in, in this idea. Um, and so this, this starting point constructs the rest of the theory of supply and demand and, um, and the, the very notion that if we just let markets exist, uh, they will self-regulate themselves, right? That, that, that theory was kind of a, a reaction at the end of the 19th century against the much more political economy-based theories, which were trying to look at production, you know, and this is kind of the history of, of, uh, of uh, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx, who all of which were trying to understand what is, what is production, what is wealth, what's the role of labor in all of this, and deconstruct that side. Uh, neoclassical economics went in a different direction and kind of said, no, that's, that, that's not really what we're, what important. What's important is whether people can maximize their utility in what they want out of things. Um, that theory was very much discredited during the Great Depression. And you have people like Keynes and, and uh, Kalecki and other uh, economists who were once again thinking about macro conditions and thinking about institutions. You have people like Thorstein Veblen uh, thinking about these kind of big picture systemic things that aren't constructed by like these people trying to trade, but rather rules, politics, power, um, institutions, design, these questions. And those kind of took authority again 
throughout the you know 40s 50s and 60s but there's a response again against that in the 70s uh, there's a there's a great book called the the road to mont pelerin which details how all of these like societies and think tanks formed bringing together philosophers economists business people to try to challenge uh, the the kind of rise of the welfare state and social democracy so by the 70s they kind of take over again and a big part of, of, of their theory of money, a big part of this neoclassical theory of money to kind of go back full circle, um, is, is that the, the origins of money is just like the origins of trade and the origins of markets. It's all about individuals trying to satisfy their interests. So they start trading in this kind of barter economy a long time ago. And eventually they realize like, wait a second, this is, this is becoming inefficient. Let's agree to have one commodity that represents uh, you know, value in general, and then we'll trade through that commodity and, uh, and it'll be much more effective. And so they chose gold or other precious metals because it doesn't, um, you know, it's difficult to ruin it. And, and you, you know, it, it kind of has like that hard structure. It's rare, all these kinds of things, right? That's that theory uh, of, of the origin of money. So MMT challenges that. Uh, and it is grounded in what's called chartalism or the chartalist theory of money, which basically says, yeah, that's, that's not where money comes from. Money, uh, when you actually look at the anthropological evidence and the way many of these societies, early societies would function, the modern in modern monetary theory is speaking to like 5,000 years of history where, um, people and societies grew to where face-to-face -face, uh, interpersonal relationships were no longer capable of managing debts to one another. So if we're like in a small group, if I can ask you for a favor, you can do something for me, we can figure that out through our interpersonal relationships. But at a certain point, that becomes much more difficult to do just with language. And so in order to keep track of the different debts and obligations that people had to one another that would avoid conflicts and blood feuds and whatnot. The authority structure in, in early societies, whether that be shamans, uh, religious figures, or early forms of the state, would come up with a unit of account that was responsible for deciding who owed what to who and how to keep track of those things, how to keep accounts of those things and measuring that um, like you would measure grain or anything or any of those sorts. So, you, so, so a unit of account was kind of created um, and accounting was created. Uh, so some people say that m many of the earliest forms of writing were, at, were not poems, but they were accounting systems to give structure to early money. And this is kind of the origins of, of early money, these authority structures granting some kind of accounting system and um, kind of saying or articulating what the unit of account would be. So, so by unit of account, what I mean is like, what, what do we call our thing that's gonna measure all of these debts? Today, we call it the dollar. Um, it's the, you know, the dollar isn't something that was discovered out of the earth or that fell from an asteroid. The dollar is an invention of, of the state of the United States of America. The pound is an invention of the, the United Kingdom and so on and so, so forth. And so the, the, the kind of foundational idea is that it's, it's the debts that we owe one, one another, the different obligations that we have to one another that form the basis of money and keeping account of that is, is, is how, how the, the mechanism evolves and develops. So um, oftentimes this could be described as an IOU. You know, you give somebody an IOU, I'll return the favorites is my IOU. So why does then um, these, this kind of like one form of money uh, evolve? Uh, you know, I can create an IOU with my business cards you know, you can do the same. We can, we, anybody can invent some form of money. The, the, the challenge is how do you get people to accept this thing? And what MMT is saying is, is that it's when these early forms of the state started to 
impose some kind of a tax and structure all of their all of the fees that were that that would that would be uh, uh, kind of given to people in different circumstances or early kind of contractual relationships that um, had to be had to be figured out through something, the early state would kind of say, all of this is going to be addressed with this unit of account that I have um, designated. And so the tax imposition, the fee structure, and the settlement of contracts all falling under this one thing, let's, for simplicity, let's call it the dollar, will make it so that everybody has to want dollars because that's how you pay your taxes. <laughs> and so it, it's a very political thing from the very, very beginning. Somebody is imposing a tax obligation and saying, if we're gonna function as a society in order to provision things for one another, it's all gonna be run by this unit of account that I'm calling a dollar. And so that's kind of like the origins of it. That's the origins of chartalism, the origins of what's called tax-driven money. And uh, it's a foundational point to, to MMT. So if we flash forward to today, we see that the unit of account is, uh, is the dollar. Now, I guess I should say, there have been moments in time where um, some form of scarcity has been imposed on uh, an entity's ability to issue a unit of account. So um, when you decide like, I choose the dollar, right? What this means is that somebody's got to issue this stuff first before you can tax it back. That's, that should be like the other important point I forgot to mention, right? So if the tax then is not to, you know, raise revenue, the tax is to make sure that everybody agrees that, or to, to force everybody to use that current, that thing, that currency, that unit of account. Um, and, uh, and, and so that means that first you got to issue or send out or spend this money that can take the form of different things. It could take the form of paper. It could take the form of a coin where you stamp your, the, the king's stamp is on. It could take the form of a stick. It could take the form of a rock with a piece of writing on a signature on it. The money thing itself is not the important part. The important part is the broader uh, kind of infrastructural layout behind it. But what it means is like, first you gotta issue this stuff out before you can tax it back. And so that inverts the way that we commonly think about uh, money. Um, so essentially kind of acting like a token or a ticket that uh, has a tax obligation to it, uh, whoever's the authority has an unlimited amount of whatever that unit of account is to issue. It's completely unlimited because it's like a legal invention. It's a legal, social, cultural invention. Um, but there have been moments in time where scarcity has been imposed on this ability. So we can sometimes think of this as a gold standard. And, and there's many reasons my, why people might want this. So for example, if you want to stop or hinder the ability of a state to issue money, because maybe you don't want it to empower certain groups in, in, within your state, and you want to restrict it, you want to force austerity, you can impose a gold standard. Maybe if you want everybody to uh, you want to design like a international market system and you say everybody's got to use the gold standard. Well, that means certain nations have an easier time getting gold than others. So you can already impose a hierarchy there as well. So scar scarcity has always been a very political, a very powerful political tool to um, reinforce hierarchies and power in different ways. Uh, gold could, could be another way to, it, during um, unstable governments that were at war. You can tell your soldiers, you know, uh, I, not only will you be paid in our dollar, in our money, but we'll also pay you in gold as well. We'll double pay you, right? So there's different ways that this, that this function. Of course, this system fell apart uh, during the 20th century because you can't force this kind of scarcity because money was never designed to be a commodity or to act like a commodity. And part of the reason why the world imploded the way it did was from this uh, kind of imposed gold standard scarcity. So we move out of it. Uh, we go back to kind of like the way it was originally functioning, this, this notion of, of, of uh, money by decree or fiat money. And so um, this goes back to this idea that first you gotta spend so that then you can tax. Um, and so that kind of gives us um, 
a starting point for understanding policy today, which means to say the United States has a unit of account. It's the dollar. It chooses that unit of account, it spends in that unit of account, and it taxes in that unit of account. The United States can never run out of dollars by definition, ever. And the United States first has to spend dollars into the economy before it can tax it back. So what MMT is trying to say is it's trying to bring attention to the, to, to, to the public to understand that the government doesn't have to raise revenue to spend. Uh, it's actually backwards. And the only constraint on the, the, the US's ability to spend is not balancing its budget, it's not, you know, where are you going to find the money? It's what's called an inflation constraint, which is what's actually real and material. Resources, labor, natural resources, technology, our capacity to produce stuff. That's what's real. So if we go beyond those means, then you run into problems. So that's the real constraint. Um, so from a policy perspective, um, how we evaluate what we can spend is, is, is something that should change to focus more on what can the economy handle as opposed to do we have the money? Because at the federal level, all money comes from the federal government. Um, and so it's a very kind of important distinction to make. And that has implications for how we define and think about things like the deficit and the national debt, which I can go into, but I just wanna see if there's any questions, I guess. Uh, or if I'm making sense here. Yeah, you're definitely making sense, Andres. Um, something I just wanted to bring up, especially the critics of MMT. Um, I know George Will called it wonkish, and I know Krugman and Kelton kind of went back and forth on some charts. Um, what are some of MMT's answers to some of the critiques that this is all pie in the sky economics? I mean, well, I think the first thing I would say is most of those people were not able to predict and in fact participated in the massive, the, the, the biggest financial and global economic collapse of modern history. Um, you know, most of those actors didn't think that there were, was a bubble in the housing market. Um, they, people like Alan Greenspan, who represents a big part of the orthodoxy, uh, actively advocated for deregulating uh, financial markets and things like that. So, I mean, on, on one hand, it's just, Modern monetary theory, like other economic traditions of thought, rejects the mainstream. So it could be possible that many people who are in positions of power have been brought up to believe in a mainstream economic worldview. But uh, if, if we look at how that's benefiting the world and whether it's been able to adapt or respond to crises, I think it's failed utterly miserably. Um, so many of the pie in the sky critiques come down to just like not even understanding what we're saying, because what you hear a lot is people talking about, well, they just want to print money or um, they want to do MMT as some kind of trick. And before I even talked about any of that, I wanted to make sure that people understand this is not talking about, you know, doing a trick or printing money. I mean, printing money is this like weird, confusing thing. First of all, like money is mostly digital today. And whenever the government spends, they don't print it. They go on a computer and they just mark up accounts. <laughs> and that's all, that's all that happens. So it's not like money's actually being printed. Um, so understanding that what MMT is saying is that from the very beginning, all government spending is the introduction of new money into the economy. And all government taxation is the, is the deletion of that money is something that uh, most people don't understand or don't haven't read or thought about, but that's like the point of departure from, from that point on. Um, so what we're saying is that we have the capacity to spend as much as we want if it's within the inflation constraint, which is a resource constraint. It's about, do you have the people and the things that will be mobilized with that spending? So it also depends on what you spend on right? Not all spending is equal. If you spend on a Green New Deal, that's not the same thing as spending on trillions in tax cuts. So what you spend on, do we have the resources? That is like the 
core of um, what MMT is saying. Now there are, you can go in deeper into layers of other things too, and we can talk about that as well. But that's, I think like the first, the first point. Um, the deficit, given what I kind of laid out, the deficit of a federal, of a, of a public uh, sovereign federal government is just the amount of money that's been spent that has yet, ha has not yet been taxed back. That's all it is. So there's this idea called sectoral balances, which basically means that somebody's deficit is by definition somebody else's surplus. Uh, the government's deficit, the public sector's deficit is by definition the private sector's surplus. Uh, it just depends on where in the private sector that surplus is. But if you get obsessed with this whole balancing budgets thing, let's try to get a surplus at the, at the level of the federal government, what that means is that you are sucking money out of the private economy. And we did that in the 90s. And we, we created a situation where people were, were pressured into going to banks and credit markets to take out, to, to, to be able to spend, to be able to consume. Uh, and that created a very, very dangerous and vulnerable situation, which also laid the groundwork for a lot of fraud to happen. Um, when, you, when the government kind of gives up its responsibility of having active policy, you, you make the private banking sector take that over. So there's, 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 there are huge problems with that as well. And um, I mean, we can go more into that, I guess, a little bit later, but that's, that's kind of like another big piece of it too. Um, government deficits equal private sector surpluses. Right. So just just a couple of um, <clears throat> points to reiterate. So with the two sides of the coin of the, the deficit and the surplus, that would depend a lot on what the money is being spent on, right? In terms of what kind of surplus you're, yes. you're benefiting from. Exactly. Um, so I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on that. And then to tie this into a practical example, if you're the president of the United States or the person in power running all of these government institutions, uh, what would you like? What would you do? So, given with the the we have a new criteria for spending, which is the inflation constraint, which I think you explained very well. And if everyone, let's say Trump and his entire administration, and they all believed in MMT and, and thought of the economy in this way, what can we do that that would be very different from what we do now? That would be very beneficial, a very beneficial use of MMT insights. Like, can you give some practical like policies or spending? Sure, examples? sure. So, so another, so we talked about chartalism. That's the foundation. We talked about sectoral balances. Another big piece of MMT is this idea called functional finance. And functional finance is different from, uh, you know, sound money finance. Sound money finance is, is all about trying to have the ideal amount of money um, because there's some abstract uh, law of supply and demand to money's value. Like that all that's all based on the neoclassical model, right? Functional finance is based on this MMT perspective. And it says, all right, look, uh, the purpose of a currency issuing government, which is the United States government, we are all currency users, you and I, our families, businesses, uh, states, and uh, local states, we're all currency users. But the purpose of a currency issuer should be to try to meet certain social goals, certain objectives, and to also keep the uh, keep prices stable as well, which is like this whole inflation problem. So those two things meet certain so social goals. Full em full employment is a big one of those, right? How do we employ our people to their full capacity to produce, you know, uh, well being, wealth, whatever it is that we decide we want, while at the same time keeping prices stable. So that's kind of like the, the framework for what functional finance uh, can and should be. So it's a political question. If you ask me, and if you ask many of my MMT colleagues who happen to be very progressive, well, right, right now we should, we should be um, using this capacity to spend at a much greater level because people right now, we're in a crisis where people can't work because of COVID. Uh, they have to be at home and they have these expenses coming in the form of rent, um, car payments, all these other things, right? Uh, unless we put a freeze or a pause on many of these expenses, it's going to be create a huge problem because people are going to start defaulting because just people can't work. So MMT would say, 
instead of doing what we're doing now, which is like giving a bunch of loans and credit only on monetary policy, we should rely more on fiscal policy, which is the ability of Congress to tell the Treasury and the Federal Reserve to spend money and put it into people's pockets. So that would mean something like $2,000 for every person monthly until this is over. Uh, it, in addition to that, it, it would mean um, certain industries making sure that the government covers payroll uh, during this crisis. It, I think those are kind of like the, the, the two big ones. It would also mean uh, unlocking the, uh, the, uh, what, what, the big thing that Trump's getting called out on, um, the, the, the Production Act, the War Production Act, um, so that we mobilize our ability to produce the PPE and the testing equipment that we need at the scale that we need. Because right now, a lot of people, a lot of states, and the Trump administration is kind of playing down uh, our capacity to test people and, and you know, uh, discussing or, or talking about numbers that are not quite at the level that, that reporting numbers that are not quite at the level that they, that, you know, truly represent uh, how people are getting, the, the, the rate at which people are getting sick. So we should be able to produce the tests and the PPE necessary to fully address this thing uh, as, as uh, robustly as possible. And that would mean spending, spending to mobilize, because we're not spending to like make a profit right now. We're spending to mobilize production to solve a crisis, to solve a pandemic. So I would do that too. Um, then I would uh, think about how we rebuild after this crisis, which would go into what I was working on before COVID, which was the Green New Deal and the Jobs Guarantee Agenda. Um, so that, that yes, I would support that. And we can go into that as well, but uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, I guess my question right off the bat would be like, a, again, I'm always trying to see it through the devil's advocate side. If you paid $2,000 to everyone, why would, um, and, and I'm assuming this is just for people who aren't working? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I mean, I think, I, think, uh, I think there's a case to be made that right now you need to get this into everybody's pockets. And then if we want to tax it out on the back end, that may be a good idea if there's some people that don't need it, but, but uh, unemployment is skyrocketing at, yeah. at a rate that's going to outmatch the Great Depression. So we need to put that, you know, it's going to be a, right. a problem. So we're kind of talking about the crisis situation, but also I was interested in sort of, when I was looking into MMT, sort of what the difference is between real economy, financial economy, and how MMT shouldn't be given to sort of like the corporations and that that's sort of like not how MMT is sort of designed. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, you know, you can, you can use the insights of MMT to, to do any number of things. And, you know, I think it can be argued that when we uh, spend m money on war and military budgets, nobody really asks this question of how are you going to pay for it? We just, kind of appropriate the money and that's that. Uh, when we, you know, it, this, even the stimulus, most of the stimulus went to support very powerful people. So uh, this, is, this is a political question. We should be fighting to make sure that the use of government spending and fiscal policy meets democratic and social uh, and environmental needs. So, I mean, that, that's what I would argue there. I'm, it's a matter of politics. Um, we live in a world where a big part of politics is a struggle for investment. What gets invested in, how is investment structured and who does the investing? Um, we've relied on private investment. We've relied on banks and credit creation. Um, there's a lot of problems associated with that. I think it creates a lot of inefficient use of resources. And we need to bring back the, the importance of public and democratic investment. Well said. And this, this kind of ties back to what you were initially speaking about, the Green New Deal, in the sense that, you know, the, the question that is always on the rhetorical 
tongues of everybody in 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 the the, the journalistic sphere is how are we going to pay for that? How are we going to pay for something like the Green New Deal? How are we going to pay for something like Medicare for all or single payer health care? That's always the kind of the go to talking point. But it seems like um, the, the the descriptive analysis that MMT is putting forward is that we can pay for it and we should. And actually by doing this, this is a far more sustainable and historically precedented approach to economics, right? Than what we've been doing, what we've been practicing. So um, maybe we can explore a little bit of, of how the Green New Deal could be implemented um, with these theories in mind. But then if we want to, the second layer to that question is what we've been talking about with Brent Cooper, the Teal New Deal, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious about sort of taking the Green New Deal policy and some of the values, the, the not only the economic ideological shift that implementing that policy would require, but also how that ideological shift has to do with the integral question about how is culture evolving, right? And how is it tied to things like policy and economic ideology mm -hmm. shifting? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so when we think about the Green New Deal, uh, I think critiques from the right, you know, say that either it will crash the economy, which is most of those critiques try to caricaturize the Green New Deal. Uh, and then you start getting the critiques that say there's no way to pay for this thing, which starts to get more related. So progressives and the kind of the left are split into ways of answering that question. MMT representing one part of that coalition. So some people talk about we'll pay for it with a bunch of public banks. Um, and while I am a big advocate of public banks, the Green New Deal is too massive and too urgent, in my belief, to be dependent on credit creation and lending. That is not the role of a bank. Banks should not be financing the survival of the planet because that's credit. And when you understand MMT, you see that there's a difference. It's sometimes called a hierarchy of money. Bank credit and lending is different from direct fiscal policy, direct money creation uh, from the government. The second way that people talk about this is, well, we'll tax the rich. We'll tax the rich and we will cut funding from the military to be able to pay for the Green New Deal. So MMT's response to that is the following. So people might say, okay, so MMT says that tax-driven money is what creates demand and, and drives the currency. So uh, besides that, why the hell should we raise taxes on anybody? And sometimes the left critiques MMT on this question of taxes. So MMTers don't especially progressive MMTers are not against taxing the rich for justice means. I, I support ta taxing the rich. I support taxing billionaires out of existence on a moral political uh, ground, right? But what, what MMTers do is we separate or, um, you know, uh, what's, what's the word I'm thinking of here? Uh, well, we, we separate the idea that taxing and financing our programs have to be together. Uh, and it's, it's a very important separation for us because there are two battles that should be fought. On one end, we should tax oligarchs. We should tax the super rich uh, because they're too rich. And because they decouple, that's the word. We, we wanna decouple taxing from spending. Taxing the super rich is important because they have too much influence over society. They're buying a uh, government they buy campaigns, they distort markets, they, you know, have monopoly power over prices, they, they create inflation. I mean, everybody critiques government spending as like, oh, we're going to get hyperinflation. Well, what about private and bank spending? That creates bubbles and in inflation all the time. The, the healthcare, because of the private insurance system, is a very inflated system. Uh, higher education is very inflated. Housing is incredibly inflated, all because of uh, private monopolies. Um, so taxing them is good, but we shouldn't depend on taxing them to move quickly and effectively now. If we need to cut carbon emissions and create the infrastructure for a post-fossil fuel economy, we don't have to wait and depend on rich people's money to be able to do this. Uh, money doesn't grow on rich people is the other thing we often say. So these are two battles that can be fought simultaneously, but um, we shouldn't be in a situation where 
we can't do anything. We can't invest on anything unless like the rich give us permission through their taxes. That's kind of the, the position that, that we take on that. Um, because ultimately the problem is you kind of have to always have rich people then to continue to tax your, your efforts. And that's also a problem. Um, some of the critiques that I, for example, had on Bernie's answers to this question for higher education, Bernie wants to put a tax on derivatives. Why would we, why would we base our entire tuition free public education system on continual derivatives on Wall Street to finance that. We wanna get rid of derivatives. We don't want derivatives to ha have to always exist so that we can finance public education. Derivatives are a bad thing. Um, so again, taxes can be used to address inequality. It could, be, it could be used to break up concentrations of wealth. It could be used to disincentivize certain bad behaviors, tax taxing bads. Um, it could, if there's too much money in the economy or in an industry, taxing as an automatic response can like uh, drain some of that money out. All of those things, taxes can do a lot of things, but taxes aren't what raises your revenue to be able to spend. So that, that's a big thing there as well. So Green New Deal, well, uh, we have you know a limited amount of years to get to at least half of what we have now in, carb in terms of carbon emissions and eventually zero carbon emissions. In order to get there, we need to build a, an entire new economic energy system based on renewables. We need to switch and transform the way that we produce things and what we consume as well. Uh, we need to provide like much more public infrastructure in terms of like more public transportation so we don't have any, as many cars. Uh, change the way we do agriculture, housing, invest in technology to invent new forms of like plastic, uh, cut down on meat consumption by investing in other ways of, of doing agriculture, uh, permaculture, all of these great ideas. So, so here going back to kind of the original idea of like, we have cooperatives, we have permaculture, we have spiritual communities, we have, uh, we have the, the kinds of cultural formations that will be necessary to uh, produce and live in different ways, which I think is what you're, what you're describing in terms of the, the teal new deal. Is that, is that, did I get that correctly? The, the That's teal? right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, a lot of these efforts will require a kind of like a leadership and a kind of cultural production that is different. That's going to require investment and support. Um, so the green new deal is about making that happen. And, uh, and, and acting swiftly and quickly to actually invest in these things uh, through different projects. So like you could have the project around energy, the project around transportation. And while we do those things, which will produce good paying jobs and whatnot, um, we also advocate for a jobs guarantee as part of a Green New Deal, which basically says that anybody who is unemployed and wants a job or anybody that's underemployed getting you know, very bad wages or very poor working conditions and wants a living wage and a dignified job has the right to enter into this job guarantee program, which essentially will pay a living wage to do local work that does not require extractive, you know, economic extractive, um, you know, capital intensive infrastructure. So taking care of one another, uh, to tutoring, teaching, trains, uh, skills building and training, the arts, music, uh, experiments in urban gardens and new forms of doing agriculture, social entrepreneurship. All of these things are things that almost, there's almost like an infinite amount of capacity to offer uh, to people. And this is part of the jobs guarantee idea. So the jobs guarantee is there to be this kind of buffer in the economy in case things go bad, people go to the jobs guarantee and once things improve and the private sector and the other parts of the economy want more workers, they can hire from the jobs guarantee program. The jobs guarantee program could give people basic skills, can help people grow and develop as human beings. You know, if you've been homeless for 10 years, five years or something, I mean, you've been hit pretty hard, right? You probably require, uh, therapy, you probably require going through some kind of, in a lot, for a lot of people going through substance abuse, uh, counseling and whatnot, getting your skills back. 
the jobs guarantee is dedicated to, to answer that, that question and then help you evolve and develop. So in terms of the, the Teal New Deal, I think we're going to rely a lot on, on, on counselors, consultants, coaches that are consciousness minded to help people develop, to help communities develop, to be able to propose the jobs and the, and the projects and the jobs guarantee, to be able to propose the initiatives that might be bigger and pay, and pay uh, different levels to, all, all of these things are going to be very important. And so I think the, uh, the way that we build the jobs guarantee and Green New Deal movement will require a lot of this integral leadership uh, that's necessary. And I, I, I tend to avoid thinking of it as trying to identify integral in a person or in a politician. And I try to think of it as like the processes that are connected, that are connecting politics and communities themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's a very, uh, very appropriate way to, to implement integral theory or integral philosophy in the public sphere, because we could very easily kind of pin the label or category integral on a particular person but you know we're not always integral at all times right and we've had this debate or discussion about you know does being a good mediator make somebody integral right somebody who's able to kind of weigh different value systems or is there something more to it and i think what you're pointing to is like well how are we it's what what's going on between these different spheres but it's really what's going on between that is that relationality it is kind of mediational but it's not so person centric in terms of like that's an integral leader it's like well integral leadership is more about the environment and the the kind of media ecology that we can facilitate and create and help catalyze these new ideas or support of these new ideas and practices so for me and like this is something that came up in our, in our discord forum is that when it comes to integral leadership uh, around these questions of the climate crisis very often i think the integral leader is kind of the invisible environment, right? The policymaker, the architect, the person who is helping to engineer and design and work with and facilitate these things to become implemented. And I think that's really important. So I, I just want to kind of echo what you're saying is it's, it's very valuable to see integrality that way in the world as a kind of a growing down theme. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's so key and we're going to need that in that kind of leadership in, in not just in politicians, certainly not just in politicians, but in people leading public agencies, in community development efforts, on the ground, grassroots organizing, in expertise, in think tanks and policy level, uh, in, in the way we construct new jobs, because so much of this is going to be about creating new renewable jobs, uh, sustainable economies. And that's going to kind of lead to this or open up, uh, I think, a lot of space for you know, integral, integrally skilled people. Uh, the other thing I'll say too is, I mean, the Green New Deal is, it emphasizes a situation where we have to value on one hand, the kind of modern empirical based knowledge of science and just kind of straightforward, like, look, if, we, if we're, if we're going to reduce carbon emissions by this amount and be able to produce renewable energy at this amount, we have to be very, very good and, and develop public trust in a certain kind of expertise and scientific knowledge. But with that said, uh, if we're also going to make sure that this unfolds in a way that uplifts communities that have been marginalized by decades and even hundreds of years of environmental injustice and harm and colonialism, we have to make sure that we, that, that our development of technology and knowledge is not done so in a way that further exacerbates or reproduces certain inequalities and hierarchies, but rather expands knowledge and expands the stories, the narratives and the framings that give meaning to knowledge and technical expertise. Uh, that's very, very important too. And I, and I think if you kind of go down the line of, 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 of how the different stages of development make sense in a Green New Deal, we'll find a role for for many different things. So Andres, just to make sure, because I know when I was looking into the Green New Deal, I wasn't quite sure of everything that was in there. And I was reading here that it says, it does provide all people of the United States with high quality health care. Is that part of the Green New Deal? Yeah, I mean, so one of, so the, I guess I should explain this earlier. The, the Green New Deal exists right now in different forms. It exists in our imagination and exists in our hearts. And it exists as a non-binding resolution 
in Congress. So as a non-binding resolution, it's just a framework that basically says, you know, climate change is real. We're contributing to it. In order to overcome this problem, we need to do these, these things. And the Green New Deal proposes that we're going to achieve these things by mobilizing our resources, massively investing in producing stuff through job creation, good job creation, and, um, and the principles of justice, right? Okay. Uh, a big part of that is that these new jobs, these new workforce, our new workforce or new economy requires certain kind of uh, you know, bill, a new bill of rights, an economic bill of rights, and Medicare for all is a part of that, is a part of that idea that if we want to build a new kind of economy that emphasizes quality of life, well-being, and sustainability, workers should not, uh, or people should not uh, have their health care depend on their employment, but rather you should have health care as a right. So yes, Medicare for all plays a big role. So, so I have a couple of questions kind of like concerns about the jobs guarantee. So I kind of wanted to yeah. put them on the table and you can assuage my, my concerns here. So I'm kind of putting my, my libertarian uh, devil's advocate hat on here. So one of the critiques of the, the jobs guarantee was that if a government becomes a major competitor of the private sector, and a lot of these jobs that you've described that are needed in these communities are like really cool, right? Like I would, I would much rather be like a consciousness development coach in a community than be a like a you know barista or a waiter you know waiter or something right yeah. so one critique is could we see a flight from private sector jobs into the uh, green new deal cool jobs that maybe pay more too and then we might see a, a dearth of labor demand in the private sector which could cause some small businesses or whatever to like crash like what do you what do you think about that critique yeah i mean i think uh I think right now we have too many bullshit jobs and we should get rid of those jobs. And I think it'd be a great thing if the public sector has an employment, an employer of last resort that is a cool job at a living wage because it puts pressure on the private sector to a improve their conditions and pay better. Uh, and, and so I think as a consequence, we will get rid of certain jobs that should have gotten that, that suck. I mean, if you, if you're making like seven bucks an hour, uh, at something that's like deeply exploitative, uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't be doing that. You, we should be using we should be valuing your humanity at a higher level. Um, that also will allow us to invest in automation on things that should be automated. Yeah. So there's, there are certain things that should be automated that like we shouldn't force human beings to do repet repetitive work on. Um, so I would say. Uh, yeah, like some, some private jobs shouldn't exist and they should improve and raise their stand, their work standards for people. And, and the job right. guarantee is something that can help do that. Great. So, so my second question is how would this actually, given that this would be a federal, you know, happening at the federal level, how would this adapt to local conditions? So a federal jobs guarantee in like Seattle would be very different. Some of the jobs or the pay and then I'm thinking about like how that would work out in like rural Mississippi or Louisiana, like, sure. like where there's a lot of rural poverty and people are making $8 an hour, but that's more appropriate with the you know, um, cost of living in the area. So how, do, how does it, how does a federal, because people will think, you know, this is a top down federal bureaucracy that doesn't adapt well to local conditions. So what's your answer to that? Right. Uh, um, so, you know, the, the jobs guarantee is actually the piece of, of, of my policy work <clears throat> that I see having the most relevance to leadership, integral, and uh, you know, kind of metamodern spaces. Because to, to answer that question, I mean, I, I, the answer in my mind is that the federal part is the financing, but the proposition of projects, the administration, um, the kind of the nuances have to be localized. Because as you said, otherwise it doesn't work. Every region has its unique characteristics and needs. And there has to be a way. I mean, the, the whole idea is for there to be a way uh, for jobs to be created to meet the needs of people at the local level. Uh, it, you know, we're fitting jobs to meet people's needs and not the other way around. Uh, meet, uh, meet people, meeting people at where they're at is the other way I like to say that, right? Um, so, so that's the way it, it, it's going to be designed, you know, in, in at the policy level and in my mind. Um, so essentially community groups, organizations, people, associations, proposed jobs guarantee projects, 
uh, ideas, whatnot, to the local employment office, to the local jobs guarantee office. Uh, those get vetted and they get, uh, the, you know, they get the green check mark and uh, they get the green light. Um, and, then, and then it happens, right? Materializing that from the abstract might take a bit more work. Um, it, they tried this both in India and Argentina and had very positive, not at a full level, but they did implement uh, kind of prototypes of a job guarantee and had very positive responses. Because even if it's not perfect or at the ideal level that, that people like us would want it to be, it's a hell of a lot better than unemployment. And just like people, you know, go fend for yourself, maybe get unemployment insurance, but like you're screwed. Um, it's, it's much more productive to just get going. Um, but the idea is to make sure that the approach and the data and the information is grounded in the needs and the nuances of the different regions of the country. Sure. And, and so my, my third question is so, some pro, uh, proponents of private sector work and, and you know, traditional kind of libertarian economics, their, their main argument is that the government is not as efficient as the private sector in, in multiple ways, including allocation of resources and understanding, responding to local demand changes, and also um, some of the mechanics of, of a, a public jobs guaranteed to me. Um, ha my question is like, so for example, I, I did an AmeriCorps program in Hawaii. There were seven of us and it wasn't um, a guarantee because I had to apply to get in, but there were still seven people growing permaculture style produce uh, at a Waldorf school. It was a, it was a really cool program in, you know, in theory. Uh, it was kind of a disaster the way that it was carried out in terms of the organization of it, the, um, what, what's the word? J just the way that it was run by some of the people who were spearheading the program. They, their hearts were in the right places, but they did not have the, management or, or practical skills to actually run it efficiently. Um, and the theory, of course, in you know, classical economics is that a private sector business, you, because it's responding to demand and getting money from consumers, you would have to run at a certain level of efficiency in order to stay in business. So, so my question is, like, if we go to like rural Louisiana to a town of 2,000 people, uh, how, how would these things, how would these programs, like the real nuts and bolts of it be run? And what would some of the implications be in terms of the strings attached or red tape that they would have to report in order to keep the program funded? Like, have you, have you thought, like, I don't know how detail we want to get into, but I just, yeah, I, just uh, um, I mean, so, you know, the, the, there is no means testing for the jobs guarantee. If you need to mm -hmm. work, you, you get a job Right. that, that you know, um, but to answer kind of the libertarian critique, I mean, um, a lot of libertarian economics is based on fantasy, uh, it, it, you know, so, so for example, there, there never in history has there ever been an economy or a society run by anything about, but with what like libertarians think from the very beginning market capitalism was financed and built by the state. And to this day, monopolies, private monopolies, and capitalism itself is heavily reliant on the state. Um, this kind of goes back to this kind of original critique that I had, that we're always embedded in a system of rules and social structures and institutions. There is no economy independent of that. I think that sometimes people think that there is because their lives are just so fucking privileged that they have no idea of what like other people actually experience that uh, have the other side of, um, you know, class and, and, and uh, cultural marginalization. Um, the, the other interesting thing I say is like, a lot of times people point at public institutions and government agencies or whatnot, and they say, they're super in, in, inefic inefficient. <clears throat> they suck. Let's 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 privatize them. So then they get less financing, <clears throat> less funding, less support. Uh, they don't get staff support. They don't get paid well. The the organization goes to shit, and then they're like, oh look, see, it, it isn't efficient. So you know, and so it's like a self fulfilling prophecy of a society that doesn't want to value public interest institutions 
meanwhile, private bureaucracies are huge and inefficient um, and oftentimes predatory and horrible as well. So there, I, I don't think there's anything to say that you need a profit motive in order to like provide quality service. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that you do. I think there's, sure, there's a role for, for profit making, uh, but it can't consume all of society. And that if we provide the necessary support for people to, to do things in, in kind of public interest, you can accomplish a lot. And we did, that was the New, the new Deal accomplished amazing things. Uh, obviously it wasn't perfect, but it, it accomplished some, some very, very important things that we wouldn't live in the kind of world that we did if it wasn't for, for that era. Mm. So I, I just have one more question, one more mechanical question. Sorry, so I'm kind of hogging it here. But so if let's say we go to like a very conservative part of rural Alabama yeah. and, and they all hate Bernie because he's a goddamn communist and they don't want to have anything to do with the freaking New Deal, Green New Deal or jobs guarantee. They don't believe in climate change. And if there are going to be jobs created, it would be like we want more like Bible thumping, like pastoral counselors. Like, so how, how does the local yeah. interface with the, you know? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's, that's a great question that, that is still, you know, we still need to kind of work out to a certain degree. Um, it's, uh, it represents a tension between kind of basic standards of you, you can't have job guarantee jobs that are grounded in racism or something. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> like, like we'll, we'll have to put limits on, on some things. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that there are people across rural and Republican parts of the country that um, would very much want to have more investment in their communities. I think that we also assume that a lot of these parts of the country are only right wing. And I think a lot of times they, they hate Democrats and liberals, but they are not totally against actual progressive working class, class-based politics. And there's something to be said there about the kind of work that can be done. Now, sure, I mean, the South in this country has a history of white supremacy and settler colonialism. This is true. This is going to be something that we, we have to face. Um, and, and this is a question of organizing. I, I mean, yeah, like, these, these will all be challenges to any kind of universal program. I mean, take education, right? Like education across the South in places that are segregated has been a challenge. Um, people receive still inferior education if you are in communities that have elites and marginalized certain people. Does that mean that we should eliminate public education K through 12? I don't, I don't think so. It means that we should fight harder to make it better. And that's probably a similar situation with, with this jobs guarantee. Awesome. Andres, I've heard you say before that you were more in favor for job guarantee over um, universal basic income. If you could talk a little bit about that. And then also, I know you're part of the team that's working on Mint the Coin, if you could explain yeah. a little bit about uh, that. Yeah, perfect. Um, so the kind of consensus around MMTers is, is that we want <clears throat> uh, a response to the the, the the problem with unemployment and poverty that, that is based on <clears throat> universal basic services and political participation. So our critique of in universal basic income is that essentially it turns us all into consumers. So we get a check and we consume with that. I mean, the, the amount of money that's proposed in UBI programs are, are very much just to meet kind of basic needs. And you just consume that check. The jobs guarantee program is meant to go a step further and emphasize the importance of community and social participation, getting people with the necessary infrastructure to do things to create value. And, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we worry about is a situation where a few tech monopolies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, whatever, end up controlling all production in the economy all of the def defining of what value constitutes and means and everybody else gets their thousand dollar checks and buys stuff from Amazon. And that, that seems to me is kind of more of a nightmare scenario <laughs> than, than something liberatory. Um, and you have this question of like, if, you're, if the universal basic income at some point actually does threaten inflation, because uh, as we talked about, you know, uh, you, you, in, in, inflation is a problem or one of the causes of inflation, there are several, 
is when you're putting money into an economy that isn't necessarily keeping up production wise or creating or creating what people want to consume with that. So a, a UBI is basically a, a claim on somebody else's labor because with a UBI, you go, you buy something. What are you doing when you're buying something? You're claiming somebody else's labor. So we got to be able to, pr to produce those things too, right? Somebody, we need to eat. We need to eat, we need to do things. Uh, we've practically destroyed the world. Uh, we're on the cliff of annihilation. This is all gonna require a lot of work, a lot of good work, a lot of changing what work means, a lot of bringing the Teal New Deal into transforming the culture and consciousness so we can do different things, so we can uh, assign value to different kinds of economic activities. And a jobs guarantee and the Green New Deal is one very important mechanism to, to getting this that I think UBI doesn't, doesn't address. Can um, I, oh, can I, just, can I just chime in really quickly on the UBI thing? Of course. So, so I'm a huge proponent of UBI, more than the jobs guarantee, actually. So yeah. I don't want to get too much into a personal debate with you. But I, there, are two, there are two reasons why I support a UBI and think it's very important. I just want to hear your response to them. So the first one is that um, it will allow people to like, create their own jobs and, and work and stuff like that. So if, I'll give you an example. So I work for three uh, older women uh, doing like permaculture home studying in their backyards and they just pay me. And so all of them are also are, have to budget because they don't have enough to pay me as much as the work they want me to do, you know, in their backyard. So if they had UBI, they could just, they could pay me and I could help them with their permaculture design stuff. And, you know, that's not like something that would be a, a federal jobs guarantee, but I'm still helping out particular individuals in that kind of local way yeah. and the second example i'll give is that uh, my partner she may have uh cancer and so mm -hmm. at some point she may need to have a very large uh surgery yeah. and if she has a surgery she'll be out of commission for six weeks Can yeah. and i have to be a full-time caregiver for her and not work for six weeks just to make sure that she, something doesn't go wrong and I have to rush her to the er yeah. so in a situation like that i think a ubi would be more helpful since neither of us would us would be able to work and so just a regular check would be helpful to stay afloat what do, you, what do you think of those? Well, I mean, I think like in, in both of those examples, you gave a, a great example of job guarantee jobs. Um, there, there's no reason why those, both of those things, and oftentimes in conversations about the jobs guarantee, caretaking and something like permaculture is given as an example. You would make more money and rather than making like, uh, the UBI oftentimes provides, just, in, in the first example, for example, some people, a family would give you a portion of their UBI to be able to do permaculture. Under a jobs guarantee, you get a living wage to do that work, right? Like you get 15 or 20 bucks an hour to be able to do that work as opposed, and part of our argument is just like the UBI is giving us scraps uh, to kind of like manage because then you, when you keep into, when you take into account expenses, uh, the prospect of other services being cut because some UBI, I'm not saying all, some UBI people want to cut other services and replace them with the UBI, we end up with very little. The jobs guarantee wants to keep all the other services and add this jobs guarantee as a universal basic right. So you get to do both of those things for a living wage. Um, and also jobs guarantee people are not against a basic income as supplemental. So if for whatever reason you cannot work, uh, you know, you might be a student, you might have to, you might get sick. Um, you know, it's, it's a matter of expanding either disability insurance or just calling it a UBI, which to me is kind of the same thing. But if you cannot work, you, you, should, you should have your basic needs met in some way mm -hmm. or another. And, and nobody on the jobs guarantee MMT uh, kind of agenda is against that. So there is no sense of like, we're just going to leave some people uh, out to fend for themselves. The, 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 the disabled community, for example, sometimes can be critical of the jobs guarantee. And our response is usually on one hand, uh, there are a lot of things that disabled people can do, but are not allowed to do in our private economy because they don't value their skills or their work, or there's no profit incentive in that. But through a jobs guarantee, it's just like, no, you could do meaningful things that you enjoy that, that that you can do that although you're disabled you have other skills and we will pay you a living wage for that and in addition there may be some people who are disabled who simply cannot work and they can still receive adequate benefits and a basic income uh to you know just to to, to be to have a dignified life 
So, so that, that, that's our position. It, it's like jobs guarantee plus, you know, it's kind of saying like the core should be the jobs guarantee. And then there are other ways to, to keep going after that. Awesome. So, so just one, one quick question of clarification. So like with my partner, if she has the surgery, yeah. what would I be the person as the caregiver getting paid through the jobs guarantee? Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're not very used to, and this is something that my wife has, has brought up uh, in her encounters because her company works, they're based in Europe. And she was hearing all of these stories of people being able to take off. Now, there's different countries, different laws and everything, but sick leave, you know, the con- mm-hmm. an extended sick leave. Right, you right. Have a kid, you get off for a full year and you get full employment for a year or two, sometimes two years with mm-hmm. the same company. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're not really used to both of those things kind of being put together, like a job that if we get sick, if we have a child, if we have to take off for an extended period, that job is guaranteed. And whether or not we're getting paid, I guess that's dependent on the job. But, you know, these are the kind of things that 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 we're, we're just not used to hearing about in this country, right? right? Some very basic kind of human centric care policies that don't leave people out on the street if they get sick. Yes. Um, so absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I feel like in, in the U S we've, we've been so you, we've gotten so used to being squeezed that, you know, any little thing that any crumbs that they offer us, we're like, Oh yes, this is what we need for liberation. When it's like, no, we got to think bigger than that. I, that's kind of part of my, my position. Uh, I want to, I want to answer um, Matt's question about mint the coin, which is really important. It brings this whole other part of, of MMT. So I talked about the deficit and how it just means it's, it's the private sector surplus and the money spent that hasn't been taxed back yet. Uh, a, a lot of people, well, people confuse the deficit and the debt, the national debt. This is related to the, to the question. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that. People say, well, what about the national debt? It's getting too big, interest payments, blah, blah, blah. The government's going to go broke. So <clears throat> As part of like a gold standard legacy, which is really outdated and, you know, we could, we should be doing it differently, but as part of a gold standard legacy, as part of the way we do things, um, our central bank, our federal reserve is in charge of managing and kind of uh, supporting and keeping the financial system from blowing up. One of the things that it does is it makes sure that you know, like bank A, the checks and the deposits that are in the loans that are happening through bank A can be accepted at bank B at the same value. Uh, there's an entity that's making sure everything is like getting the core support of the dollar and having the same value and that they all have the same, the required amount of reserves, which is just an accounting thing. Um, the central bank is in charge of all of that. So one of the policies that, that it does is managing interest rates. And when we deficit spend into the economy, this means that um, more, more of that income is gonna go into banks because that's where people store their income, right? So, the, so bank reserves are gonna go up. And one of the things that, the, that our government and the Federal Reserve has decided to do is to use monetary policy to make sure that those reserves don't go up too much so that interest rates don't fall. And it does this by draining those reserves and swapping them for treasury securities. So when we deficit spend, part of the policy is that the, the, the Federal Reserve gives out these treasury securities and in exchange takes reserves. What this essentially is, is like moving an, uh, money in an account from a checking account, reserves, to a savings account, treasury securities. And that's the national debt. The national debt is just the net assets in the form of treasury securities out there in the economy. Um, these treasury securities are also a financial instrument of the United States government, um, just like all money is. It's a kind of a swap, a swap of instrument reserves for treasury securities. These treasury securities are savings account, they get an interest. Uh, that interest is something that the government could always pay because as, we, as we've discussed, 
the government can never not pay its, its debts when it comes to in dollars. When other countries import their stuff that we use to like China, we, we buy their stuff at our stores, we buy them in dollars. They take those dollars and they say, well, we're not just gonna like keep these dollars at our bank, let's buy some treasuries too. Let's like, we'll get some interest. So they just swap, they create a savings account essentially at our Federal Reserve. So that's that. I mean, people say we're in debt to China. We're not in debt to China. China just has savings accounts with us. That, that's all that is. So all of this process is called borrowing. But MMT's argument is like, it's not really borrowing. All we're doing is doing monetary policy that we've decided that to do, that we don't have to do, but it has nothing to do with the US going broke or defaulting or not being able to pay its interest. The problem is that it is a subsidy going to these treasury security holders. The interest is, and maybe we want to do things differently and we probably should. So there's different ideas about how to, how to do things differently. And one of them is to just bypass this whole bullshit argument about the debt and treasury securities and say, you know what, let's just tell the United States mint to mint a coin and give it a thousand, give it a thousand, give it a trillion dollar value, mint two of those coins, two trillion dollar coins, and tell the Fed to deposit that money into the treasury's account, and then boom, there it is, direct financing. And instead of doing this whole show with treasury securities and the debt and blah, 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 let's just do this, we'll mint the coin, and we'll pay for COVID stimulus or Green New Deal or whatever through this process instead by minting these coins. Uh, that's the idea. Right now it's part of Rashida Taib's office for the, uh, it's the ABC Act, which stands for Automatic Boost to Communities Act. Um, it's part of uh, a, a prepaid debit card that you get with $2,000 assigned to it to get over this, this COVID crisis. Um, that gets financed by minting the coin. So that is the, the minting the coin idea to it. And, um, you know, it, it goes hand in hand with an effort to get these debit cards out to people, um, to be able to get them at certain places as well, like the post office. Um, it's very connected to the notion of transforming post offices or expanding their services to also uh, uh, offer uh, financial services. So public banking, essentially. If you wanna have your, if you wanna deposit your money, get, make a checking account or get a small loan, you can do it at the post office. You don't have to go to Bank of America. You can go to the post office. So it's, a, it's, it's an expansion of that public service as well. And if there's a crisis and we need to get money to people quickly, we can do it through the post office. Everybody has an account, the Federal Reserve. We mint the coin, we get those funds, you get your money at the post office, or you go, you get your jobs guarantee wage from the post office, boom, that's it. So that's minting the coin. Awesome, thank you, Andres. It's a wonderful explanation. Uh, I guess to kind of, in my head, wrapping all this up, I know you kind of brought up the Matrix earlier and stuff, and I don't know if you remember the character, the, the Frenchman from the Matrix. So a lot of the things that seems to be stopping all this from happening is like political will and power. Mm -hmm. And I guess to wrap it up, where, where are we going? What would you recommend? Uh, what's the future hold? Oh, man. Um... <laughs> Just, it brings uh, causality from that scene in the in the Matrix. <laughs> uh, it's a great I, scene. Yeah, I, I love just watching uh, YouTube video essays on on the Matrix. They're always fascinating. And Andres, just really quickly, maybe we can tie in Matt's question with a little breakdown from your perspective on kind of like what went wrong for the Bernie campaign and what's the future of the progressive movement moving sure, forward. Sure. Yeah, I think I think that that's that's kind of where we're at. Um. So you're absolutely right that this all comes down to, to political will and organizing. Um, I think it's a very, very uphill battle. But who would have thought that somebody like Bernie would be as popular and close to the presidency as he got uh, five, 10 years ago? I don't think anybody would have. We, we've definitely made a big jump. Um, I think there's a lot of hope as well. I mean, the popularity and the potential that organizations like Sunrise, the Sunrise Movement 
uh, offer is, is a beautiful thing. You have 15, 16, 17 year olds from, you know, across the South, across the country, organizing, interested in this stuff, you know, so definitely we know that there's a wave of progressive energy coming from the youth that is barely getting activated. I think that is, that is a very important thing. Uh, I think one of the problems with the Bernie campaign and, you know, you have to give all credit to that campaign for doing an incredible job and I have nothing but respect for Bernie and what they tried to do but you know there's always room for for feedback and everybody has their own opinion I think on one hand the Bernie base the base of people that were propelling the campaign got very easily baited after he was the front runner so we had good strategy in terms of bringing everyone else down but as soon as he became the front runner the country expected something else from him and Bernie's base kind of stayed the same and, and just kept trying to fight, pick a fight with everyone. And the media was able to bait this really well and present that image to people who, you know, maybe are not just not as politically radical or haven't been as activated as, as everybody else, you know, coming from another place, needing a little bit more of a guide. They showed them this image of the, the Bernie base staying relatively the same, which in, in, in many ways was also manufactured, but, but the base played into it. A, lot, a portion of the base played into it and, and, and got baited. And that was, a, that was a real problem. And part of this, I think, in, in my personal opinion, is because there was, a, there was a bit of incoherence in the Bernie base too, where you had like the Chapo Trap House people, the Jacobin people, the AOC people, uh, the MMT people, uh, kind of all a bunch of, you know, different groups. And there wasn't really a, a, a sense of coherence of just everybody had like their own hot take. And that became a big problem uh, once we were like on top. And uh, so I think that's another thing. And then from the campaign itself, um, I think that it failed to make the kind of inroads and build the kind of trust and do the kind of work in the South with the black community. And you cannot have a progressive movement in this country without the black community because they represent a huge part of the struggle for justice in, and liberation in this country. And so it's not just the campaign, Bernie, but all of us, we have not been able to make that, to integrate those movements economic justice kind of new deal. the way i see it is like new deal everything we fought for in the new deal with everything we fought for in the civil rights movement we haven't fully integrated those two things yet and that's part of our task we've done really well at going out into you know these urban coastal centers and organizing there we've done relatively okay in the midwest but we got to go into the south and that means a lot of us who have had a great time moving to places that are very progressive and liberal for, you know, which is there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, we, we, we've all, it's benefited us and it, it, it's been great, but we need to think about how to uh, build relationships or just move, move to the South and realize that the future of this country can't just be a few pockets of liberalism in, in coastal urban areas. Um, and that there is a lot of progressive democratic socialist potential in the South, in rural America. And we got to, we got to, we got to put in the work there. So yeah. those, those would be my thoughts. Yeah. That, that echoes to, not to, um, to go on too long, but that, that does echo some of what Michael Brooks has been saying in terms of, or, uh, uh, Noma Key and the Noma Key show has been saying, about uh, building unions and working with labor movements and working with local communities in the South and actually building these relationships, which to be honest, you know, it, in, in the four years since the last campaign from Bernie, we, a lot has gotten, been, been done. You know, we yep. saw a kind of a beautiful early um, support of unions for Bernie in like Nevada and, and elsewhere. So we're making inroads, but really like that's, that needs to be the focus, the down ballot unions, local yeah. organization, yeah. getting involved in the South. I mean, this is where it's at. I mean, I just joined the, the, um, the democratic socialists 
and uh, they have a little chapter here in St. Petersburg. So I'm, I mean, yes, this is a progressive kind of um, uh, refuge city in that sense in, in Florida, but I mean, making it, making an effort here could make the difference between the city becoming a uh, kind of a corporate Democrat pro Biden, like our, like our mayor supported Biden before he needed to really. Um, but you know, that, that could make a difference with the communities of color and with the working class here. So yeah. I'm very much interested in these kinds of questions too. Yeah. Yeah, going absolutely. Forward. And, and, you know, um, there, there's no doubt that the entire media establishment apparatus coordinated together to shut down Bernie. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think like it caught us, you know, it's probably true that we all thought that was gonna happen, but when it really did, it caught us a little bit off guard and by surprise. Yeah. And our response wasn't as coordinated and coherent as I, I personally would have liked it mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Andres, thank you so much. This has been great. We're going to have you back on the show. Um, you know, as things develop, it would just be great to have your ear and to have your, your, your expertise as we move through these unknown territories that we're entering into. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, all. Jeremy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you guys, if you can keep recording. I just had a real quick question and stuff. Maybe you could edit it out later on, but. Oh, sure. Uh, oh, awesome. and, um, and you know, one thing that came to mind is in your in your uh, background intro, uh, you talked about the philosophy thing and the spiritual and the existential, and we didn't get into any of that I like, know. stuff. Yeah. And next time, I'd, I'd really like back. to, yeah, because this was like a very hard economic, you know, kind of a lower right quadrant conversation. So we'll have to do the <laughs> yeah. other part too sometime. Sounds great. For I would sure. love that. Thank you, and, and Jeremy and Matt, do you have a couple minutes to to chat? Sure. Yeah. All right. I'm going to pause the recording now. Uh, yeah. so thank you everybody for tuning in. If you're watching this on YouTube, thanks so much for your support. Uh, join our Discord channel. We'll leave a link to it in, in the YouTube somewhere. So thanks everybody. Thank awesome. you.